Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. <laughs> good morning. Uh, uh, well, good morning. another year has come by, and I hope you are all older and wiser. And more important, <laughs> uh, I hope everyone uh, are free from the suffering of um, COVID pandemic. Okay. Um, this year, uh, I would like to share with you Venerable Yinsheng's teaching on Heart Sutra. Every morning and evening liturgy service at Bodhi Monastery, we chant Heart Sutra. The Heart Sutra is short and concise, and for people new to Buddhism and non-Buddhists, it can be very confusing to read, I think. But with the insight from Rebel Yinsheng and his deep wisdom, I hope to make clear the details about Heart Sutra so you can appreciate it more each time you chant at a liturgy services. In the lectures this year, I will first go over the structure of the sutra. So you have a general idea of the sutra and then I will go into each section in detail, okay? So um, just ask a question. Uh, have you got the handout with the structure breakdown? Yeah, good, good. Um, it has been um, uh, designed to present the structural outline and actual sutra text. So you can use it as a quick reference over the course of the next few lectures. Okay. Um, actually, the Heart Sutra is based on actual experience of emptiness. And so it is not something that can be approached with logic or formulae. Language and logic are limited because what is discussed in the Heart Sutra is based on a practitioner's experience of emptiness, which involves the dissolution of worldly concepts. What we see in the Heart Sutra is, the, uh, is an attempt to relay that experience and we must be aware of the limitations of language in describing something that is beyond language, okay? Um, Venerable Yin Shun has dissected the Heart Sutra based on a, pra a practice of insight into emptiness and the experience of the truth. The Sutra has two major sections. So now we are looking at the structure outline. First section is the statement of purpose and also the summary of the teaching. The other major section is the detailed explanation of the teaching. Within section two that provides the detailed explanations, there are two parts. One is part A, which is the principal teaching. And this is for those with the right spiritual capacity to understand this prajna teaching. The other is part B, it has the provisional teaching which comprises of the mantra. 
This part B is for those who lack the spiritual capacity to understand this prajna teaching, but the Buddha still wants to give these beings the chance to develop faith in prajna. The bulk of the Heart Sutra is the principal teaching and this has two sections. Section one presents the, the instructions to show prajna, which focuses on the method of practice and result. Sorry. As for the method of practice, the sutra has essential practice to investigate and observe emptiness. Next, it goes into summary about investigating the emptiness of various dharmas or phenomena. And finally, a conclusion of the meaning of emptiness. Regarding 81.2, the results of prajna, it shows what one can attain if they practice prajna and accomplish the practice of prajna. This result is twofold as prajna can result in nirvana, which is attained by practitioners of all three vehicles. Prajna can also lead to the perfection of body, which is only attained by the Buddhas. The other part is A2 which uses similes to praise, to praise, sorry, to praise the virtues of prajna. So this is the general structure or outline of the Heart Sutra based on practice and awakening. Please remember this because the Heart Sutra is very popular as a chanting sutra, but its true value can only be appreciated when we practice the methods taught within the text and let prajna shine through us. Now, um, let's move on to the detailed explanation of the Heart Sutra and study each part, section, sentence, words more carefully, okay? Mm. Uh, first, I would like to explain the, the title of the Sutra. The full title of Heart Sutra is Prajna Paramita Heart Sutra, which can have several meanings. Heart means core or essence, and the Heart Sutra can be interpreted as follows. One, Prajna Paramita refers to six Prajna, uh, six pramida, sorry, should be six pra pramida, not uh, prajna pramida, which represent Mahayana Buddhism. And Mahayana Buddhism is the core of the whole Buddhism. So the term heart refers to Mahayana Buddhism. Two, the Prajaparamita doctrine is the core of 
Mahayana Buddhism. All Mahayana teachings emphasize wisdom, that is, prajna. So, Prajaparamita teaching is the core of Mahayana Buddhism. Number three, the Heart Sutra can also be interpreted at, as the core summary of the larger, larger Prajnaparamita Sutra, that is the Maha Prajnaparamita Sutra. This is a very large text consisting of 600 physicals. Can you imagine 600 physical? <laughs> Quite a lot. So to make it easier to promote this teaching, the core of all essence of the sutra was extracted to make the shorter version so that people can easily recite and remember. So let me give you a, a, a quick summary. The, first, the point one uh, is means um, Prajaparamita uh, means six Paramita, sorry, typo here. Uh, sorry, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so six Paramita uh, represent Mahayana. So Praja Paramita Hat Sutra means Mahayana is the core of whole Buddhism. Point two means um, Praja Paramita is core, the core is the core of Mahayana. Okay. Point three. Point three means this Heart Sutra is the core. So Heart Sutra is the core of Prajna Pramida teaching. So uh, I hope this uh, won't be too confusing. I just try to, to make it clear to everyone. So the title Prajna Pramida Sutra can have these different meanings. So the, 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 the important point is, uh, if we learn the, the Heart Sutra, actually we, we learn the, the, the core of uh, Prajna Pramita teachings and the core of Mahayana teaching and also the core of the whole Buddhism. So uh, it's a good idea to, to just learn the Heart Sutra and then we have everything, okay? So in general, Mahayana Buddhism places wisdom or Prajaparamita as the core or, or fundamental teaching. And this is marked by the Heart Sutra. So learning the Heart Sutra is to learn the essence of all Mahayana, Buddha Dharma. Generally, a sutra will contain three structured parts. Some of you may know this, but some of you may not. So the, the three parts, the first part is the preference, the preface, sorry, the preface, which provides overall information about the time of the teaching given the location, the audience, 
the causes for the Buddha to expound the teaching and so on. Usually it begins with, thus I have heard. The second part is the body of the sutra, which is where the main content is found. The third and the last is the epilogue. This includes the depiction that all listeners in the gathering uh, express uh, acceptance and adherence to the teaching, show willingness to promote the teachings, pay respects to the Buddha, and finally depart. So this is the, the, the third and the last part. If you look at the Heart Sutra, however, it does not have the first and the third part, right? Rather, the first sentence is when the Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva was immersed deep in Prajnaparamita. So it doesn't look like the standard sutra, right? Nevertheless, there are different versions of the Heart Sutra. And the version translated by Dhanapala in the Song Dynasty does have all three structure parts of the sutra. Some people say that the version translated by Venerable Xuanzang is the summary version. And so it does not have all three parts. But we can look at this from a different angle. It could also be the case that the version translated by Xuanzang is the historical preliminary version of the Heart Sutra. The Heart Sutra fundamentally is the core is the core teaching of the uh, Mahaprajaparamita Sutra. Within the 600 fascicles of the Sutra, there is the chapter on cultivation connected to Prajaparamita. In this chapter, there are sentences that are virtually identical to the sentences in the Heart Sutra. In this chapter, the teaching is not taught by the Avalokite Srara Bodhisattva. Rather, it is what the Buddha expound to Shariputra. So, the Heart Sutra is likely to be the extract that summarizes the essential teachings in the Mahaprajnaparamita Sutra. Even the Mahaprajnaparamita Sutra is so large and voluminous, the ancient masters have tried to make it easier for us to learn and remember the Prajna teachings. Therefore, they have specifically extracted the core teaching and created a separate text that we now know as the Prajnaparamita Heart Sutra, or in short, the Heart Sutra. This short summary version is easier to 
propagate and recite. So given that the Heart Sutra is a summary of the essential teachings in a, large, in a larger sutra, then naturally it would not have the first and the third structure parts of a standard sutra. This makes more sense. What do you think? I think this the um, the, the idea I just present makes more sense. Okay. Over time, some people uh, thought that a sutra must have all three structure parts, and when they saw that the first line of the Heart Sutra just has the name of our Lokiteshvara Bodhisattva, they probably decided to add the so-called missing details. So some versions record that the Heart Sutra was taught by Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva. This background information is to help you understand why there are different versions. If you can read the Chinese, but I, I think in English version, probably only the short one. Is it uh, Professor Ring? Have you seen that the the longer one have three parts? Yeah, yes, I have seen that. Uh, but usually, especially in Zen groups, it's the short one that they use and they chant. Yeah, the longer yeah, yeah. one is not necessarily chanted. Okay, it's just for study and for yeah. research. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for your feedback. Yeah, um, yeah, I, 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 I saw the, the longer one uh, when I uh, studied the Prajaparamita Sutra at the university. <laughs> so ac academic version, I think. Okay. Um, so uh, at least should not be taken. So the information I just given should not be taken as the way to criticize one version over another. It just different purpose. So all version have their value, I think. So we should look at the body of the sutra, the content of the actual, actual teachings. As long as they are consistent, then the teachings can be relied on, regardless of which version is used. We should develop an appreciation and respect for all versions and for the ancient masters who have translated and propagated them. And so we can still access these versions today. For the rest of the talk, we will use the most common version, which was translated by Venerable Xuanzang. It is the version without the first and last parts of a sutra. This very first sentence expresses the main content of the teachings. The rest of the sutra is really just elaborating on this first sentence in detail. In this opening sentence, we already have the information about the person or people the Dharma teaching or method and the cause and result. 
So we have everything in this first sentence, right? Okay. Um, in the first sentence, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva is the person who can undertake the Prajaparamita practice. The part was immersed deep in Prajaparamita. He observed that all five aggregates are empty, reveals the Dharma teaching. This part is also the cause for liberation. When one practices Prajaparamita and penetrates the truth that all five aggregates are empty of intrinsic nature, they can attain the liberation. So this part is also the cause for liberation. That means because of fully realizing the nature of emptiness, one can transcend all forms of suffering, which is the result of fruits to be gained. So essentially, the sutra is about how to overcome all suffering. And the only way is to accomplish prajna or develop transcendental wisdom. Now, let's explore these four aspects in detail. The term, the name Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva can be interpreted as a Bodhisattva that has attained true freedom because of having the, the insight and wisdom that comes from practicing and accomplishing prajna. That means Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva need not be restricted to the iconic great Bodhisattva that we know of. The name of uh, Bodhisattvas reflect their virtues. So when a Bodhisattva has such and such a virtue, they are called such and such a Bodhisattva, isn't it? It is for this same reason that in the Avatamsaka Sutra, we find many bodhisattvas since time without beginning that have the same name. This means anyone who has this virtue of being free due to accomplishing prajna can also be called Avalokiteshvara, okay? The word Avalokiteshvara um, has two parts. Uh, one part is Avalokita, which means to see, to look, or observe. So what exact, exactly does one look at? The practitioner looks at or observes the truth behind our universe and existence. Through this passage, we can understand the ultimate truth about life and human existence. Being able to observe these truths is the function of transcendental wisdom or prajna. 
the term Ishvara means freedom. Freedom here refers to being free from the uh, shackles of the five aggregates that are defiled and the cause attachments. This means one gains uh, both physical and uh, mental freedom and ease. So, based on the actual text, he observed that all five aggregates are empty, is the observation aspect and transcend, transcended all forms of suffering is the freedom aspect. Can you see the point? So based on these definitions, the title of a Lokiteshvara Bodhisattva can be interpreted in two ways. One is that Avalokiteshvara refers to the iconic great Bodhisattva as a specific being. The other interpretation is that anyone who can observe and realize the truths and lay upon be liberated from all suffering is also called Avalokiteshvara. And this is the definition that should be used to understand the word, word Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva in Heart Sutra. So it's necessary to, to refer the name Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva as the, the Bodhisattva we usually call Guan Yin in Chinese, okay? So it can be any Bodhisattva who accomplish um, uh, insight, uh, to accomplish the insight into the truth and uh, free from all sufferings, okay? Some sutras teach that a bodhisattva who is at the eighth bhumi or higher is equipped with wisdom and freedom of form and of mind. They are the avalokiteshvara among the bodhisattvas. So here is to to how can how can I say to to locate or to 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 find what kind of bodhisattva can can be called avalokiteshvara. So here, according to some uh, Mahayana sutra, the bodhisattva who attend the eighth bhumi or higher can be called Avalokite Shvara, Bodhisattva, okay? However, when Bodhisattvas are at the first bhumi or stage where they penetrate the truth, cut off all attachments to I and mind, and transcend the suffering of cyclic existence at this, at this level, at this level, they are also called Avalokiteshvara. So, so we have two different views. First, the Bodhisattva uh, attain an uh, eight bhumi or higher are called Avalokite. Swara. The, the second point is the Bodhisattvas who attended just first Bhumi can also be called Avalokite Shvara because they, they have the same a similar 
uh, ability to uh, the the Buddhist sattva attain the eight rumis or higher. Okay, so this means that even at the earlier first rumi, the stage of affirming uh, conviction. When a bodhisattva practice a course with the wisdom of emptiness, they can be considered a partial avalokiteshvara. Okay. Further, avalokiteshvara bodhisattva can be any practitioner that has attained deep understanding of truths. And because there are different levels of understanding of truths, so there are different levels of Avalokite Shvara. So we have three different <laughs> interpretations. So the, the last one is the how can I the 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 standard is not too high, the criteria is not too 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 strict okay but it's not everyone can can be called avalokite ishvara so those who uh, have uh, uh, how can i say those who have deep understanding uh, of truth is not a common people okay so so just let everyone know uh, we have different different interpretation on uh, Avalokiteshvara. Okay. So in this sutra, we 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 take uh, the second one, or even cover the first one. The word Bodhisattva comes from the Sanskrit language and is commonly translated as Pusa in Chinese. Bodhi is translated as awakening. That means to awaken to the world around us and the meaning of our ex existence. Having this understanding, we will dil diligently walk toward realizing the ultimate truth underlying our existence. Understanding the ultimate truth is not something uh, garnered by worldly knowledge. The only way to peer into the truth is with the wisdom of prajna. A Buddha is one that possesses perfect awakening, while bodhisattvas take this perfect awakening as their goal. Sattva is translated as sentient beings. Sentient reflects uh, the possession of emotions, particularly the strength of steadfast determination and desire to push forward, push forward. Humans and other animals all have this quality of emotions and so are called sentient beings. Sometimes this strength is likened to a diamond to reflect this quality of strong willpower and perseverance. Based on the meaning of um, the body and the sattva when uh, when combined 
when combined. Bodhisattva can be interpreted as the following uh, meaning. One, ascension being that possesses motivation to attain awakening. Two, a category of sentient beings that possess transcendental wisdom. That is, they must have understood the ultimate truth of existence to a certain extent. And three, those who seek awakening and guide sentient beings. All sentient beings have the quality of determination and the willpower. But sadly, such strength is applied to fulfill their personal cravings for food, lust, fame, and fortune. In contrast, Bodhisattvas apply their determination and the strengths to focus on realizing the ultimate truths of existence. So in order to attain such a realization, they develop great courage, work hard to benefit all sentient beings as they seek to the perfect perfect, uh, to seek perfect themselves. To realize this goal, they are even willing to endure all sorts of hard hardships and never complain. That is why in the Sutra we see, uh, we, uh, the, in the Sutra we see descriptions of praises about how bodhisattvas are willing to sacrifice everything and how they willing, willingly undertake tasks that are challenging and difficult to accomplish. So, uh, a true bodhisattva applies their determination and the strengths to complete and perfect the goal of awakening to uh, awakening to the ultimate truth, Live, delivering uh, delivering sentient beings from suffering and cyclic existence, and to perfect themselves. Only such a being is worthy of the. Bodhisattva title. The third definition is not commonly seen in English materials. Uh, Sanskrit or Pali scholars do not interpret Bodhisattva this way. In this respect, Awakening is the object that Bodhisattvas seek to, uh, seek to perfect, while sentient beings are the objects that Bodhisattvas want to benefit. Therefore, the goal of Bodhisattvas is to seek the Buddha's awakening and the method to achieve this goal is to deliver sentient beings from suffering. Sometimes this goal and method of bodhisattvas are translated as to seek the Buddha path and deliver sentient beings um, in Chinese, the word used is Tao, which is often translated as pass. However, this re reflects 
the old translation of Sanskrit word body. So it should not be translated as pass. Okay. When talking about the goal of Bodhisattvas, the Chinese style should not be interpreted as a pass. Rather, the awakening of the Buddhas. So we, we seek the Buddha's awakening and deliver sentient being from sufferings. Okay. Based on these interpretations, a bodhisattva is not uh, some uh, supernatural being like a ghost or deva, right? <laughs> Rather, they are more like worthy sages, but even more noble. This means that anyone who has the aspiration to seek the ultimate truths and to save sentient beings can be regarded as a bodhisattva. When a bodhisattva's practice reaches the stage where they can observe and awaken to the emptiness of the five aggregates and hence transcend all sufferings, then they can be regarded as an Avalokite Shvara Bodhisattva. Avalokite uh, Shvara Bodhisattva is the this, uh, description about a person or sentient being who is able to observe the truth using prajna. The next part of sentence is was immersed deep in prajna which is reveal the practice method used by an Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva. Prajna is very profound. The, the, the description of profound and uh, superficial, uh, superficial are innately relative and there is no fixed standard to determine what is profound and superficial. But the use of profound here specifically refers to the wisdom that allows one to experience the truth of emptiness. Profound here is not something that ordinary being can gain easily, hence it is profound. In the Prajaparamita uh, Sutra, there is an account where a disciple asks the Buddha, what is the meaning of profound? The Buddha replies, it means emptiness, no characteristics, no desires, no rising and falling. These are the, the meaning of profound. Can you understand? <laughs> Very profound, isn't it? When the Sutra says emptiness, no characteristics, no desires, etc. This is referring to the truth, which is not something an ordinary person is able to comprehend. Therefore, emptiness is described as very profound. In the treatise on the 12th method, it says that the meaning of profound mainly refers to emptiness. So 
what is profound emptiness okay the factor that enable us to observe that all five aggregates are empty of intrinsic nature is profound prajna or wisdom <clears throat> in the dharma teachings the function that allows practitioner to observe is prajna that is only a person with prajna can observe emptiness prajna allows us to awaken to the truth and is likened to the light of a flame <laughs> that allows us to see the things in a dark room <coughs> excuse me um, the five aggregates encompass all material and uh, psychological aspects of the world when we are able to see how all five kinds of aggregates are empty of intrinsic nature then we are able to see the truth of all dharmas or phenomena in some different versions of the ha sutra out the words five aggregates they add the words and so forth which is the uh, the subject that we will discuss below namely the soul force or etc includes the the 12 bases 18 elements four noble truths and 12 links of dependent co-arising um i, I think uh, it's time for me to stop here and better to leave some time for you to, to ask questions. So is the, the, the talk clear to you? I hope so. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, any question about the, uh, what I just said? It's very clear. I have one question. Yes, please. Uh, and that is the Heart Sutra is about wisdom. <clears throat> but I always thought it was significant that it's put into the mouth of Avalokiteshvara. Because Avalokiteshvara, the iconic or archetypal bodhisattva, is identified with compassion. Yes. And in, by putting the sutra in the mouth of Avalokiteshvara, we are connecting compassion and wisdom yeah very good point yeah yeah very good so so that's what you mean that's why uh, the editor we, we call editor yes <laughs> the redactor the editor the whomever yeah yeah <laughs> i put this name as the, the 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 speaker of this sutra right yeah okay good very good thank you very much for your feedback um I think I, I, I should explain a little bit about uh, emptiness because in the later lectures, we, we will see it has, two, it has two meanings, actually. It probably not commonly known by, uh, by Buddhists. Mm. Yeah, so emptiness when we uh, use it, when it is used in in the practice uh, context i mean the when when we contemplate the five aggregates what we want to realize one what we really want want to see is the 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 character of uh, no intrinsic nature, right? So why we have attachment? Because we regard everything as something, uh, something having intrinsic nature. 
intrinsic nature means uh, permanent, the character of permanent and the real and can exist without any conditions. So it, we, we usually have this, uh, uh, how can, this, this conception, and uh, no, sorry, perception. Yeah, but actually it's a, a wrong idea to regard uh, things we perceive uh, something with intrinsic nature. When we regard things uh, as something uh, with intrinsic nature, our at attachment occurs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So the other meaning of emptiness is nirvana, is is uh, how can I say? Is uh, is the state beyond our experience? Mm -hmm. Okay. So emptiness have two aspects. One is the as aspect of contemplation. The other aspect is the 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 result of the contemplation, okay? So, so we will <coughs> see the description, um, no arising, no ceasing, and uh, not uh, uh, pure, not defiled, defiled actually. So it means uh, when we, uh, realize the truth, what we experience, what we experience beyond the, what we, uh, we have in daily life. So it's difficult to describe the, <laughs> the situation, but these words, uh, the editor saying that the closest to the, the state of Nirvana actually, so I hope you can remember these two aspects. Otherwise, you will point, get, yeah. confused, get confused. Oh, uh, no intrinsic nature. What, why is no arising and not pure, et cetera? Something like that. Okay. Yeah. So I, I hope I can <laughs> convey the meaning of the Heart Sutra. Um, explained by verbal insurance. It's difficult, but I, I, I try to. <laughs> okay, any question? Too profound? <laughs> <laughs> Is it okay, Larry? The message clear? Uh, I mean, it's still, you're trying to explain a lot of technical language in there. And I, I think the most important point to take away though, it's, this is part of a larger body of literature, the Prajnaparamita literature, right? So yeah, yeah, if, exactly. if you don't understand anything else today, that's the first thing to understand. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, I will give you my notes and it could be a sort of article to read so that you can understand more <laughs> about how Sutra. It's difficult. Even in Chinese, it's diff difficult to me to explain <laughs> the meaning of the text. Actually, because uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's not the, it, uh, something we can understand uh, through language or logic, because the, the language the, the, the sutta use is sort of a description to uh, close to the, the state of nirvana. So it's just something similar. So we need to practice and then we can understand, oh, it means blah, blah, blah. <laughs> okay. 
I think it's time we should finish the class. Okay, uh, three bows to the Buddha. Out to the teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Tomorrow.